Jay's event is brought to you by Eco Game, which is one of the projects from Game Habitat that we run uh, together with the Ian Stald uh, Utveckling Skona, which is in English would be equality development in Skona. Um, and then to tell you more about the project and also to tell you more about uh, our state of the industry that we are now, I invite you, Jacob, who is the project manager for Eco Gaming. Hey, Jacob. Hello, can you see me? Yes, I can see you well. Right. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I also need to share my screen as well. There you go. I think you can see it now. So uh, as Aliana said, my name is Jacob. I'm the project manager of Eco Gaming, which is what we uh, webinar is a part of. Um, so I'm from Jamsur uh, So I'm from that side of the project. And we, this project is funded by the Swedish Ministry of Equality. The project aims to support and help the game industry in uh, southern Sweden in their work with equality. And later this year, we will also release a handbook with like concrete methods and tools on how you can start uh, or further your work with equality and inclusion in the game industry. So that's what I'm, apart from this, currently writing. It's really, uh, it's really exciting. Um, as we're financed by the Ministry of Equality, we have mainly focused on gender during this project, but we have worked with intersectionality in mind, and that means we have worked with other parameters as well uh, and tried to join them together. A lot of these things interject in a lot of ways, so a lot of the methods and tools we have developed apply, applies to other aspects of diversity as well. As I focus on how to create games and workplaces where anyone is welcomed and safe and have the possibility to thrive no matter who you are. I also want to be upfront that we will mainly talk about men and women and other gender identity won't be as present. Uh, this is solely because many of the studies I will cite have only used male and female categories, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's the reality. As you're probably all aware, the game industry faces some challenges when it comes to equality. Uh, and I will try to map out the current state of the in industry when it comes to equality, ranging from the games to the studios to the industry as a whole. As I will try to give you a broad understanding of the challenges and opportunities that we are facing, uh, it means that I won't have time to go really in depth on all aspects. Uh, therefore, I recommend that if you have something that if I say something that you, that especially piques your interest or that you want to uh, know more about or you don't understand what I mean, so you would like to me to explain more, just write down, write down your question. In the end of this webinar, we will have time for questions and I will do my absolute best to answer whatever queries you might have. Um, we also have another speaker who uh, won't be here today uh, because of work obligations, but we have uh, Oscar's presentation as a video, and I think it actually would make sense to start off with that. Oscar, as he will explain, uh, is going to present a study that Oscar made that is based on the game industry in Malmö. So I think it makes sense to kind of start locally and build upon that. So I will just make sure to play the video. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot join you on Tuesday, so I've prepared this presentation for you to watch uh, some days ahead. Uh, but I hope you'll find something interesting here and maybe we can arrange some sort of two-way communication in the future. So, some of you might have seen me before, uh, but maybe not. My name is Oskar Bork, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a study I did about equality and diversity in the games industry last year. And this was part of my master's program in the social sciences uh, with a focus on gender study. Uh, and this study was performed here in Malmö in cooperation with Game Habitat, which also arranges this event together with Jämställd Utveckling Skåne. So uh, today I'm going to tell you all about this study and what I believe we can learn from it. Now that you know a little bit of who I am, I'll tell you the plan for today in a bit more detail. 
I'll start by telling you shortly about how I, how I ended up here uh, and uh, how this study came about. Uh, then we'll zoom into the study uh, more in detail. So I'll tell you about uh, why I did it, uh, how, uh, what the clever participants told me and my analysis of that. And I will mainly focus on the concrete problems, uh, goals and methods of doing equality and diversity. Uh, then I'll wrap up and thank you for your time. All right, uh, how did I end up here in front of a bunch of cool game developers and game industry professionals? Well, uh, I have a background in social sciences, uh, gender studies in particular, and this story starts somewhere in the beginning of 2019 uh, when I was thinking about uh, doing an internship as part of my master's degree. So my particular education means that I've been doing a lot of reading, thinking and discussing about how gender in various ways um, affects our lives and shapes the condition of those. So, but, I, uh, but I'm also a gamer. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here you see my pretty mainstream gaming history, very compressed. Um, and somewhere along the lines, those two interests, the, the, my education and, and gaming, uh, intersected and became this fascination with the contemporary games industry. So with this newly found interest, uh, I turned to Game Habitat uh, and to ask if they were interested in having me as an intern, doing some work with them uh, about the quality, diversity and games. So uh, that's some really short background and now let's dive into the study. So when I started designing the study, I set out to take a snapshot of where the games industry was in terms of equality and diversity. And I, when I say equality and diversity, I use it in a wide sense, referring to concepts such as uh, equal opportunity and affirmative action. Um, or in Swedish, jämställdhet and mångfald. Jämställdhet och mångfald. So I broadly view it as a set of perspectives, actions and aims to realize an environment that accepts uh, but also strives for social difference and multitude. So I had to do some kind of measurement, right? Uh, I considered various ways of doing this, like talking to HR departments um, or analyzing policies and so on. but. I soon decided that my time and effort would be best spent investigating what some developers and game industry professionals in various positions uh, actually think about equality and diversity. So I decided to do interviews, uh, which also happens to be my favorite method of doing studies. As for the purpose, I wanted to explore what perceptions of equality and diversity there was. Uh, how the gaming industry is experienced in terms of equality and diversity, and lastly also what needs there are to continue to develop the work towards a further equality and diversity. With these questions in mind, I did 10 hours, hours worth of interviewing with 10 willing participants. Uh, of course, the 10 hours of spoken material was a lot to deal with analytically, so I spent a lot of time and energy to figure out how to present this also in a smart and accessible way that can actually benefit people. So eventually I had a result which looked something like this uh, with different chapters. Uh, and uh, I just decided to structure the findings in the following chapters. So defining the problems for equality and diversity to uh, work with. Uh, focusing on the goals of equality and diversity, what we're striving for, uh, sort of defining some methods, concrete met methods of doing this, uh, and a chapter on further discussion, which I won't focus so much on now, and lastly some technical stuff about the study uh, and some limitations to it, and I won't uh, go into that either this time. So, uh, focusing now on the, on the chapter about the problems, uh, I work from the standpoint that uh, a clear sense of what the problem is, is will help us understand what we're doing when we're trying to, to do some kind of equality and diversity work. Uh, the interviews featured a spectrum of different ways of answering this question, 
And the first position is exempl exemplified her beautifully and condensed in the following few words from an interview. Um, a person who said, do we even need equality and diversity? What are we trying to solve? Maybe you have encountered this position yourself out there in questions of equality and diversity. Uh, to me, it's a move that skeptically puts the purpose of equality and diversity in doubt. Is there really a problem? It also puts the burden of proof on the side of those doing equality and diversity. But I was really happy to encounter this view, uh, as it exemplifies to me the great importance of putting work into formulating problems that is as clear as possible. Uh, as for those that actually had positive formulations of problems, I took the analytical liberty of categorizing them in the following levels. So the, I put them on some kind of highest level, the in industry level, and then in the workplace, and lastly also in the games, uh, the product of, of their work. So I'll take a closer look on them now. So in the workplace, uh, the first thing that many participants talked about was organizational practices or workplace structures. So that's the distribution of work hours or types of work, um, places and spaces where, where we work, uh, types of contract, non-disclosure agreements, vacation and overtime. Um, yeah, there are. how these are organized it can work for as well as against more diverse and equal outcomes, right? So, but not only are the organizational practices in themselves important, but also that uh, the information about them are shared and made accessible in the workplace. So they need to be known. And when they're not explicit or known, uh, habits, biases, and uh, preconceptions about people might take their place. Unclear workplace structures uh, might also put especially interns and new people in the organization at uh, invulnerable positions. So um, working conditions uh, was brought up as well. Um, is, it, is the work compatible with having caring responsibilities for children, for example? Uh, physical and psychosocial environment uh, where noise like bathroom accessibility and lights are of course very important and lastly um, workplace culture which, which also of course is the psychosocial environment so workplace cultures uh, the participants were talking about uh, what's considered like normal and common sense in a workplace uh, so that could be also what is deemed important or funny, respectable or professional in a particular workplace. And how is failure and setbacks dealt with? Is the workplace culture acknowledged to exist uh, or are there like different opinions about what kind of culture there is? Uh, and what qualifies as a problem that's part of the workplace culture and of course, that question is very important if we're trying to do equality and diversity work. So back to the question of what we're trying to solve. Um, one answer based on these interviews might be that we're trying to make it so that uh, these things on the left side here uh, does not have excluding effects on some groups of people. And if they do, we have identified areas that our effort for equality and diversity can address and seek to change. On an industry level, the problems identified here was uh, a lot of people talked about conferences and especially representations of speakers. So who, who is a programmer, a 3D artist, and what do they look like? So it matters who is seen in industry context, according to the participants. Alcohol culture uh, at industry events uh, can create vulnerability for many people, which of course is important. Um, other common industry practices such as unpaid internships was brought up, as these can act as economic barriers that excludes quite heavily uh, who can access these types of work. And networking was also brought up as an important where can these events be an opportunity to reach broader groups that uh, today 
does not have uh, access to to the games industry in the same way that other people have. Okay, so now lastly, looking at uh, where we can find like problems or things to work with uh, regarding games or the production of games. So here the participants talked about, uh, they identified this as a very important uh, area of doing equality and diversity work. Um, especially because it affects consumer demographics uh, in, in the way of like um, who plays games and who produces them. <clears throat> uh, depending on how what kind of games we, we create, we, we create also those perceptions. Uh, and uh, thinking about uh, equality and diversity in game production is also important for attracting underrepresented groups uh, to the industry. All right, let's look at some goals for equality and diversity. Um, so if problems uh, tell us what equality and diversity might be about, the, the concept of goals answer why we want to act for a more equal and diverse games industry. And um, two dimension was uh, repeated throughout the interview. So. One being uh, diversity for the sake of reaching a more effective industry. The other one being for the well-being of people in game development. Uh, we look closer on them now. So um, having a more attractive industry will draw talent in and allow them to develop experience and expertise within their fields. We might reach a more meritocratic and skill-based recruitment in uh, doing diversity work. Um, there's a possibility of, re of reaching untapped markets, some participant thoughts. Like uh, basically reaching more gamers. And lastly, some uh, participant thoughts about uh, a diverse workforce as effective in creative solutions and processes. And for the other dimension, um, focusing more on the well-being of, of workers, people doing games. Um, some general positive effects were like breaking patterns of illegitimate hierarchies and empowering people, like everyone. And um, reaching a greater awareness of workplace culture for uh, the benefit of everyone as well. And... Uh, like social difference being challenging and stimulating, which is important for personal development and, and creativity. Some positive effects for minorities uh, was suggested to be remedying the positive negative effects of being of minority status within a group such as feeling singled out, uh, stressed, different, we weird, or as not quite belonging within the majority group. And the overarching goal in relation to minorities that was brought up in the interviews can broadly be defined as arriving at an inclusive environment that allows for difference. Being included happens in different ways. So um, be it that the work is organized in a way that, that's inclusive to different people, that the physical environment does not exclude, or that there's an understanding that some perspectives tend to be amplified and considered common sense, while others are silenced and made particular or different. So being listened to is in this sense a goal of equality and diversity. All right, lastly, we'll look at some methods of equality and diversity. So we have looked at equality and diversity work as issues to address, that is problems. Uh, with the goal of achieving some desired outcome. Um, what fund fundamentally uh, remains to discuss are ways of doing equality and diversity. So the methods. And there were two distinct ways of approaching this question of methods. Um, one which was what I call the mechanical approach. And where participants focused on cause and effect principles and the viewing equality and diversity mainly as forcing statistical change. Uh, another tendency instead started about thinking how things are now, underscoring that the industry is structured according to certain conditions, norm and practices today, rather than being in a neutral state. This tendency rather 
was more analytically and and uh, were more curious in the reasons that we have this unequal distribution of for example gender in in the games industry today and how might we change that so so we reach a more equal equal one so looking at concrete ways of doing equality and diversity starting at the workplace um, one suggestion was to create conditions for a diverse workforce so Inclusive organizational structures can mean clarity about promotions, policies relating to childcare, vacation, and other HR structures that relate to different people's needs. Um, give workers the possibility to have a say in relation to these policies, uh, policies and structures is also important. So some people highlighted sharing external HR support for smaller companies was also brought up as, an, uh, as a possibility working with uh, unions and having worker representatives to systematically work with organizational practices and working conditions, uh, as well as getting access to expertise and helpful networks was brought up. Uh, awareness about what norms are in effect and taking steps to support those outside the norm in different ways can be very effective ways of doing equality and diversity. And discussions are cool, but plans of actions are cooler. Uh, so, more uh, participants said more companies need to take it more seriously, not just think about it, but also make plans of actions. So that's important in these issues, right? To not just have endless meetings, but also make some concrete plans. On an industry level, um, one idea was to value diversity at conferences, and thus we're more likely to put time and effort into actually finding diverse speakers and realizing that the path of least resistance probably leads to a, a homogeneous lineup. And uh, quotas and monitoring speaker time could be effective ways of solidifying diversity goals. Um, thinking about what culture we might encourage through how uh, alcohol is dealt with at events. Uh, mentorships um, in a local developer community could be effective ways of helping each other out. Um, and this could also be arranged by studios partnering up. And lastly, in, in game development, uh, working with norm critical perspectives in game development was discussed as a fundamental way of diversifying games more. Mm, and thus replacing habit uh, with a more conscious choice. So knowing about what stories, characters, settings, narratives are we not considering maybe. Could be a focus. Less habit, more choice. But of course, um, a lot of the participant thoughts that a suitable uh, equality and diversity methods are not a fixed set of actions, but ultimately must come from the context and the people involved. So in that sense, the main method of equality and diversity might be understood as that of uh, yeah, valuing equality and diversity as a social, uh, but also economic good. And from there, actions can be made in the direction of diversity in, in ways that make sense within the context. All right, so wrapping up, where are we now? Um, my contribution to this question might go something like this. Uh, I have made a small study, but uh, it answers the questions of what challenges and ways forward towards equality and diversity some game industry professionals in the local games industry identify. Um, and looking at the games industry more nationally and globally, I think we see constant change and development, uh, which I think is hopeful. However, paradoxically, some things seem Stub to stubbornly remain, uh, for example, like this gendered, heavily gendered uh, workforce slowly, slowly moves to more, towards more equal distributions. But we seldom talk about how different positions and uh, different types of works are gendered, like administration or programming, art, and so on. Uh, and crunch culture also s seems to be more discussed, but also prevail in many places. Uh, I, however, I, I believe strongly that the games industry uh, and its active participants have great potential to build new ways of organizing itself 
uh, in terms of like working conditions, events, collaborations, and so on. Um, and I think this can have social impacts in the long run and, and actually achieve some sustaining change. But it, it requires dedication and time, uh, and you being here today uh, is a great sign of that. There is already, I believe, so much knowledge and experience and competence in the games industry. So share your perspectives, uh, look for concrete ways of realizing your ideals of diversity and equality in your community and workplace. And I think that's a great start. And connect with and support each other in your mutual aims. Uh, I think the broader awareness part sort of is starting to fall into place and that more actions, events and concrete plans can be made uh, going forward. All right, so with those words, I will end my presentation and thank you so much for your time. Uh, I had to keep it real short and cut the contents of the report quite heavily. So if you're curious about the study, I'd recommend that you could email me. You see my mail here. Or simply ask Game Habitat or Jämställd Utveckling Skåne and they'll be able to send you the report. Okay, thank you so much and goodbye and I hope we have a chance to meet uh, in the future in person sometime. Bye. Okay, so uh, it's, it's weird that we can't really thank Oscar uh, as Oscar isn't here right now. However, uh, it's worth mentioning that this report is actually what led to this project as one of uh, a person in Oscar's class did their internship at Jamsrutling School. So that was how uh, our, these two organizations were connected with each other, which led to this project. I'm actually going to start where Oscar left off and I'm going to start off with talking about the games. Um, and the game culture and like the games and the gamers. Um, it comes as no surprise to any one of us that the interest for games is huge. It was reported by DFC Intelligence in August that there are 3 billion gamers worldwide. That's almost 40% of the whole world population. I was blown away when I saw these numbers. Um, this is something that is really important to keep in mind throughout the rest of this talk, because as media shapes, it influences our way of thinking and seeing the world around us. That means that the game industry holds an enormous power to shape culture and be a force for good in the world, seeing as it has a reach of 3 billion people, which is insane. Furthermore, it was recently reported by ISFE, which is Europe's video game industry, an organization that gathers the industry in Europe, that 45% of the gamers worldwide are uh, in Europe, sorry, in Europe, are women, which challenges the old stereotype of the typical gamer being a male teenager. Um, and this is a stereotype that many still hold on to mostly from outside of the industry, but there are still some people in the industry that think that this is our core demographic when the demographic is much wider than that. There are, however, uh, a few ways that gaming habits of men and women differ that are worth noting. One is that only 23% of female gamers play online multiplayer games compared to 73% of all gamers. Uh, well, this particular study that uh, looked into this uh, didn't try to find the reasons um, for, the, for this number. Um, there are many other studies that have looked into and done interviews with female gamers about what kind of games they play. And um, in many of them, that it has come up that many women stay clear of online multiplayer games. Um, and in those studies, they have cited reasons as um, toxic communities in online multiplayer games and women and uh, female gamers receiving a lot of harassment while playing. Another noteworthy aspect is that gaming among, uh, among men and women are the same uh, until around 13 years of age. And between 13 and 25, gaming amongst women are significantly lower than balancing out again at around 30. 
This can be explained by the fact that gaming is often still perceived as a male interest, and during the formative years of puberty, girls are bombarded with the message that games are for boys. So girls stop playing games, uh, not for lack of interest, but rather because they are told to. Uh, this is shown by the fact that the gender distribution among gamers are starting to balance out again after 25. This is not that uh, teenage girls don't like playing video games. The interest for games are universal. Uh, it's because they're told that they're not supposed to. And then again, when you get older, you often become more <laughs> comfortable with going against these societal expectations. Uh, and leave them behind and more and more follow your interests, which, which explains this dip and then balancing out again. When it comes to the games, they are still dominated by male characters. Um, in this chart, we can see the distribution uh, of, uh, of the gender of main characters in games presented at E3 in 2019. More and more games move towards giving the player a choice when it comes to the character they play, for instance, by using character creators. But when it comes to games that have a set protagonist, um, it's more often not a male protagonist. It's four times as likely uh, as, as common with uh, a male protagonist than a female protagonist. So there's, a, there's still a long way to go here, but we can see positive development, it's moving forward. Um, also, not only in terms of raw numbers of how many characters are of a specific gender, but also in the way that women are portrayed in games are improving. Games uh, have had a quite extensive problem with sexualize sexualization of female action leads. Uh, where the character almost needed to be sexually pleasing, to be allowed to be the protagonist, being uh, a badass action hero wasn't enough. You also had to be portrayed wearing like unfunctional, revealing clothing uh, in a way that their male counterparts didn't. Like, I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic example of uh, the armor bikini, which is, uh, something that have occurred in games again and again and in other kind of especially fantasy um, content because of medieval armor, late armor. But we are seeing um, improvements. A good example could be Lara Croft, that when Lara Croft uh, was created as a character, it, was, it received a lot of backlash for uh, being highly sexualized and not being allowed to just be a kick-ass action lead. But this is something that has changed and moved towards a better with recent uh, Tomb Raider games where well, things like clothes being more practical for actually raiding tombs. Um, and also in the last few years, we have seen an upswing of AAA titles with female protagonists that challenge, challenge these old norms in a lot of ways, um, like Horizon Zero Dawn, for instance. And these games kind of prove that this old way of thinking that um, it's only young boys who play games and therefore it has to be a male lead in the game. Um, it disproves those uh, old ideas, showing that a game can be highly successful with a female lead, which is always nice to see, because even though this is something that the majority of the industry uh, knows and feel comfortable with, there are still uh, people who are worried and afraid and in a way that it's also hard to blame them for. I will go into that later. Um, we have also seen a few games in the last few years where values such as equality and inclusion are really at the core of the game. Uh, for instance, this year we saw the release of Tell Me Why, which explores the trans experience. So there are a lot of 
um, historically indie games have been in a lot of ways pushing the boundaries uh, a lot further than AAA titles when it comes to inclusivity. But we have started to see it really taking off also in um, the AAA sphere, which is a lot of fun to see because um, there's a lot of money in it. And this is a business and money sends a message. So I'm hoping that we will continue to see uh, for the development. I'm just going to go back to the old slide um, uh, as well. But this also leads us back to um, to game culture. Um, I have to mention the problems with game culture being, or parts of the game culture being toxic. And when I say to toxic, I'm using it's kind of an umbrella term for all different kinds of hate, such as sexism, racism, transphobia, homophobia, or just being like plain mean to other people. Um, this does not only affect gamers who are marginalized within the game community, but also the developers. There have been a lot of problems when game developers, both as studios, but also as individuals, have been harassed when they create content that challenges the destructive stereotypes that have occurred in the game industry. And this, this deters and scares away many de game developers from creating content that really pushes the boundaries because they receive hate. And there have been instances where people receive death thre threats. Um, it's a serious mental health issue. So we can't really fault anyone for be, being uncomfortable or being scared to, to delve into um, uh, creating that kind of content. But we must also remember that this is a minority that still want to hold on to these old values within the game community. Um, it's a really loud minority, granted, but it's still a minority. And honestly, this is something that really breaks my heart. Um, as someone who grew up playing video games, where games is my longest standing hobby and something that have improved my mental health immensely, I truly admire game developers, um, not only for the amazing products that they create, but also for how they have impacted my personal life and seeing how they are treated by the community um, sometimes upsets me incredibly. And I, I, I want to mention this because I know we have a lot of students pressing, present here today who are studying to become game developers. Uh, so I kind of want to address you, especially, and say that the majority of the game community really has your back. And I sincerely hope this issue improves quickly, uh, hopefully before you go out and enter the work life. Um, and also that the parts of the game community, uh, we who love what you do and appreciate for you become louder. This is something that we also need to um, take a responsibility for to kind of counteract that. So I just wanted to take this uh, uh, this opportunity when I have you all gathered to shower you with some love, because, uh, but also to to point out that what you do from the creator side affects the community. Daring to work on these issues have an effect as to what the community deems acceptable. The standard you set shapes the game culture, not just like in the moment and in specific games, but also for future gamers who grow up with these games and helps to make sure that no one feels they aren't welcome because they are a woman or trans or gay or a person of color or someone with disabilities. Like the game community has such a potential for being inclusive and we should always strive for that. Because as a certain Uncle Ben Parker once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, there are many, many ways of creating games that can lead to positive change. And I am unable to go into too much detail because that would like easily fill out a whole hour. 
But to understand why all of this is important, I need to briefly explain how uh, explain representation theory. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of you have heard about the discussion of representation in video games and in other kinds of media. Um, and representation theory is a field of study within social science. There's also something in mathematics that is called representation theory that I have no idea what it is. Uh, but I'm talking about the social science part of representation theory because that's where I have my background. Uh, the field of study explores how the people we see represented in media influences us as people and us as a society. Uh, creative media such as movies and games can both enforce and strengthen um, and challenge harmful stereotypes by who is shown performing tasks and filling out roles in, uh, in games and, and movies. By, by always having, for instance, um, a man as the protagonist in the action games, as it is historically in, in uh, video games, it reinforces an idea in our society and, and in our culture that only men can be that type of hero. And the opposite effect is also true, that by showing a, a varied cast of characters being hero, heroic, it can challenge that stereotype and enforce the idea that anyone, no matter who they are, can be a hero. As this shapes our way of perceiving the world, um, it has real-life consequences and can, further down the line, lead to issues of uh, discrimination. In practice, uh, this can be done in a lot of ways, depending on what kind of game we are talking about. You have, uh, for example, games like Dragon Age Inquisition, which is a massive fantasy RPG uh, that explicitly discusses equality and racism and homophobia and, uh, and the power dynamics of societal structures are woven into the game world which is one way of doing it, but another way is just to remove all aspects of gender or other kind of dimensions, like for instance, Tetris, because gender is not relevant in Tetris at all. And both of these are valid, and it's just a matter of kind of finding what works for, for your game. Um, representation also influences people in the way that it affects what people think they can achieve. Uh, by seeing someone who you can relate to doing something, it creates the idea that you can do it as well. It creates role models. Um, and this is important because, for instance, a kid seeing someone like them, no matter what aspects it's based on, being a doctor or maybe closer to home, a game uh, developer, they understand that they can do it. Um, I will go further into this as well uh, when we're talking about the gender divide and employment within the game industry. Uh, but a point I'm trying to make is that games have an effect on the world and shapes our way of perceiving the world, which means that the game industry have a huge potential to be a force for positive change in our society. It's more than um, a pastime. It's more than a hobby. It's it's something that sh shapes our society, which is a bit intimidating, but it's also really cool when you think about it. Um, another side I would like to mention when it comes to uh, the games and the gamers is the financial be benefits of creating games with equality in mind. Uh, as mentioned, the number of female gamers drop drastically between ages 13 and 25. Uh, this age group is one of the strongest consumers in the game industry, or when we're talking about the younger ones, maybe it's rather the parents of uh, this demographic. And by creating games which manages to hang on to uh, the demographic of young girls, the ones who uh, are, are dropping off um, by 13. There is massive financial gains to be made. And it's, 
it's logical uh, by not appealing to 50% of the target audience, a lot of the revenue is lost. 50% of the revenue is lost. So while it might be nice to talk about equality just as uh, a moral issue, what is just and uh, right, we need to um, uh, we need also to achieve equality because it writes as a business. Uh, for many, it boils down to uh, to income and expenses, and whether it is worth investing the time and the money it costs to work actively with equality. And matter of fact, I, is that it is. Uh, I'll return to the subject later on in the webinar because there are numerous aspects where uh, finan the financial gain of equality development is evident, so it will be kind of sprinkled in here and there. But the point is that uh, there's a lot of money to be made to create equal in creating equal gains. Uh, continuing on, uh, I think we should discuss the studios uh, and the challenges that are facing like individual studios. And by that, I don't mean that these are issue, the issues that only one studio faces, but rather issues that need to be addressed on a studio level. Uh, and there are issues that concern both structure and culture. And this will in some ways kind of meld together with industry-based problems. Um, that will I, that will be the next part of this talk. Um, but they are they are hard to separate as the studios make up the majority of the industry. So you'll have to bear with me when it becomes a little bit muddled. Um, one of the most evident equality challenges facing the studios is the gender distribu distribution of the workforce. And the organization Swedish Games Industry, or Datasvetsbranch, uh, reported that roughly 21% are women and 79% are men in the Swedish game industry. Um, again, the available numbers are based on legal sex, and therefore people who identify as non-binary uh, are not visible in these statistics. Um, but anyway, this number is moving towards a more uh, towards a more balance uh, with about one percentile a year. So it's slowly moving in the right direction, but we need to do what we can to speed it up because we can't wait. Oh, I should have done the math beforehand. Uh, we don't have time to wait 29 years for it to be leveled. Um, to get more women into the game industry, there are challenges both in recruiting and in keeping women in the industry. Uh, if we start with talking about the recruitment side of it, we have to address two major ob obstacles to overcome. The first is that this around 2080 divide in the workforce, that around 20% of women, 80% are men. Um, it actually mirrors what we can see in game development education in Sweden. Um, and furthermore, it's representative of the gender of the people applying to, do, uh, to study game development. This leads us into the other major challenge, which is that it's generally easier to recruit what you already have. And by that, I mean, as, as workplaces are shaped by the people in it, it also becomes more appealing to people who resemble those who are part of it already. And this is true for all kinds of groups, really. Um, and this, what this leads to is that one of the obstacle for attracting more women to the game industry is the fact that there are relatively few women in the industry. We, we end up with kind of a, a chicken and an egg situation, what came first. Um, and a way to counteract this, uh, one way among other, many, uh, is to thoughtfully think about how you present your company, both in terms of images, but also words. Who are you showing as part of the company when you are placing ads for hiring? Uh, who's seen in pictures? Um, how are you describing your workplace? 
However, if you do brand yourself as an inclusive and diverse company, you also need to put practices into use within the company to promote equality. Uh, otherwise, people will feel it's hypocritical and untruthful, which has been a problem for, uh, uh, for some. Um, this whole chicken and egg situation also comes into play when it comes to the physical workspaces. With a homogenous group, uh, which means a group where everyone is quite similar, it becomes hard to see the need that someone from outside that group might have. There have been issues where studios have thought that they ha had a welcoming environment, but they were missing things because no one in the group has that specific need. Um, and this can relate both to both small and larger things, such as do we have sanitary pads in our restrooms or are our officers uh, wheelchair accessible? And something might seem small, but all of these things together creates the big picture of who is welcomed into the physical space, in this case, uh, a specific game studio. And taking the time to really analyze yourself, um, both the physical workplace, but also the workplace culture, is something that benefits everyone, not just those who challenge the norms. Because when we're discussing issues like this, uh, issues of quality, and it's based on a lot of research and statistics, it leads to some generalizations that needs to be made because this is how it's on average or uh, generally speaking. Uh, but the fact is that a category such as men that we're talking a lot about today are not all alike. Uh, it's not a completely homogenous group. People are individuals and everyone has different needs and things that make them feel appreciated and comfortable. By openly having discussions within your company about your needs as a person, everyone benef benefits. By starting something, uh, by starting now and not waiting until the need is more evident because you're hiring someone who uh, goes against your norms, uh, for instance, it also means that that person is not singled out and put on the spot, uh, which is a really horrible situation to be in. Um, Equality and inclusion work is not something that should be done by the person who is marginalized. Their opinions and thoughts are important, um, but laying it all on them and putting all the responsibility on them puts them in a really bad situation, in a really bad position um, that benefits no one. Um, how, circling back to how the skewed gender balance starts early on, uh, research have shown that there are few factors that are as important um, for young people who chooses to go into the tech industry generally and the game industry specifically as them playing games when they are younger. And there are a few things that correlates as strongly. So playing games when you're young leads to studying tech and uh, going into the tech industry and especially the game industry and as uh, and this it starts really early on as as early as like choosing your high school or gymnasium um, and this downturn in female gamers i mentioned earlier is at the precise time when people are starting to make their first choices in uh, choosing a career when they're starting to Think about high school, uh, which kind of, in a lot of cases, locks you into a path or at least makes it harder to, uh, to change it. So by losing this demographic as gamers during this specific age means not only a direct loss of income, but also hindering the largest uh, recruitment pool possible uh, where the most talent can be found in the future. And I'm not like now we're going into abstract concepts of like 10 years into the future, but, but that's the perspective we have to have because games are the future. I, I really believe that when it comes to um, like content con uh, consumption and 
the way of telling stories, I do think that games are the way uh, stories are going to be told mainly in the future. So that's why it's important to not lose track of the long-term perspective as well, even that that might be more difficult to take into account into an annual budget report. But it also means that it's an equality issue on a larger scale, um, because the tech industry holds more and more power in our society, and an unequal access to the tech industry between genders means an unequal access to power in our society between genders. So this is not something that only affects the game industry. This affects all of society and how we want power to be divided in the future. Um, as I said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, this is where we're at. It's also worth noting that the gender distribution of game developers uh, specifically is more unbalanced than in the industry, in the game industry as a whole. Uh, women tend to have other positions in the company, such as working in human resources. Uh, the representation of women in leadership positions and upper management is also uh, lower uh, than the average of 21% in the game industry as a whole. Um, so we can't focus solely on just the hard numbers, uh, the hard and fast numbers of gender distribution. We also have to take into account matters of who sits in positions of power within the companies to make sure that uh, the distribution of power is also, uh, is also equal. Uh, continuing on to the next part uh, of these challenges facing studios, we have seen that the game industry have some troubles keeping women in the industry as well. It's both a problem of getting people in, but also keeping people. Uh, female game developers, uh, the, the average the average career of a game developer is quite short and generally uh, it's unfortunately an industry where a lot of people uh, because people are passionate but they burn themselves out and that's especially true when we're talking about female game developers and there are a number of factors that are worth mentioning on this topic relating to both structure and culture within companies that leads to uh, women leaving the game industry. As I mentioned before, upper management positions are typically held by men within the industry. The opportunity to advance your career are limited as women. Uh, many women in the industry have also described that they are expected to prove that they belong in a way their, their male uh, colleagues aren't expected to. And this is something that keeps on going year after year that you still have to prove that you're worthy of your spot there. They're met with skepticism about whether they're good enough, while men are assumed to have earned their place from the get-go. Uh, there are quite widespread issues uh, with workplace culture within the industry, with uh, macho at attitudes and jargon. Uh, for many women in the industry, uh, sexist jokes are a part of their everyday environment, which is awful. And here we also have a point, uh, or here we have something that a lot of people are skeptical uh, towards working with equality because they are worried that it means that their behavior will be policed and it will lead to a more strict environment in an industry that really values agile working conditions. So I want to make it clear that no one wants you to have less fun and make you less comfortable. This is make about making sure that everyone feels comfortable, safe, and promoting a good psychosocial work environment for everyone. Uh, I have many times heard the argument that, it, but it's just a joke. And I'm sure that many of you have heard someone say that at some point as well. But matter of fact is that jokes have real life consequences. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown that sexist jokes and sexist banter leads to actual discrimination and sexism. It drives people out of the industry and 
it is a real problem. So we can't just leave it at it's just a joke and people need to grow, uh, need to toughen up. It is uh, it's bigger than that. Um, and this also leads further on to something that I don't think anyone here thinks is easy to discuss, but it's a part of reality that we must face. Um, the game industry have severe problems with harassment, uh, sexual misconduct, and assault. Uh, not just in the industry, but the whole game community, actually. Um, I'm fairly certain we're all familiar with Gamergate in 2014, where a number of women came forward with the, their testimonies about the atrocities they have been subjected to within the industry. And since then, people in the industry have continued to speak up. Just this year, we have had several testimonies from both the industry and the community uh, about what they have gone through. And this is extremely important to face head on, because if you don't face this horrible part of the community that we are a part of, how can we expect to change it? And to explain why these problems are so widespread is something that needs a lot more time than we have today, but it is connected to both structure and culture of workplaces. It's a combination of uh, macho and sexist workplace cultures with lack of structure for handling complaints uh, and actions to ensure safety. As an industry and a community, we have to draw a line in the sand and carefully examine ourselves and our company's determines if I, uh, in some way, are contributing to this. Oof. This is the le my, uh, my least favorite part of talking about when it comes to equality in the game industry, because there are so much potential, but there are still so many things that have gone wrong along the way. And while it's getting better, there are still things happening. Um, moving on from that, there are many more aspects of equality in the industry that are easy to miss um, as an equality issue. Crunch, for instance, also has an equality dimension to it. In case of people work in an industry that has like a family, maybe kids, working that kind of overtime is dependent on someone else taking care of things outside of work. Um, as women in the game industry are also living in the same society as the rest of us, uh, which has its own struggles and problems with gender norms, this becomes an issue. Women are culturally expected to take a larger responsibility when it comes to unpaid housework, such as picking up kids, laundry, cleaning, so on. This is a hub this is a problem that I hope we will be done with soon, but right now it's part of our reality. And this makes it harder for women in the industry to balance crunch with family life, causing women to leave the industry. I would also like to mention an area where we have seen a lot of uh, progress, uh, which is something that makes me really happy, which is concerning LGBTQ people in the industry. There are still incidents where people are subjected to harassment, but generally studies have shown that uh, LGBTQ people feel at home in the game industry to a larger extent than in other industries and oftentimes in society generally. In a lot of countries where studies have been made about this, um, LGBTQ people are actually represented in the game industry to a slightly higher extent than in the general population, because LGBTQ people are drawn towards the game industry, uh, because this is an area where uh, the game industry are really taking a lead and leading the way, and also because uh, games are really popular in many LGBTQ uh, communities. The last thing I want to talk about concerning the studios is the financial benefits of equality. Uh, McKinsey Management Consulting, which is one 
of the most respected uh, financial and business business consultant agencies in the world have studied the effects of equality, inclusion, and diversity on revenue and releases an annual report about their findings. And they have shown that companies that actively work with equality and inclusion are much more likely to succeed financially. Uh, again, the game industry is a business and quite often it boils down to expenses and revenue and there are a few things that make more sense in order to increase revenue than towards than working towards an equal organization. Companies with a greater uh, gender diversity are 25% more likely to outperform unequal companies and uh, those companies with and companies with ethnic diversity are 36% more likely to outperform uh, other companies. So this is something that really has an effect. Um, and there are a number of factors con that contribute to this. A more di uh, diverse recruitment pool means a large selection of talent, which benefits the company. Uh, a diverse workforce means more ideas based on different experiences on how to solve problems. All around, it makes for better and more competitive company. An equal company also improves mental health of the employees, which leads to higher productivity and cuts down on cost with rehabilitation. It also leads to more talent staying in the company. And as we know, recruitment and hiring and training new employees, that it's quite expensive. And as I talked, uh, uh, as I talked about earlier, an obstacle for equality is inequality itself. So it also has a snowball effect and leads to long-term gains as well. Even in terms of harassment and misconduct, there are financial aspects. Dealing with these horrible situations costs a lot of money um, and it damages the brand. And working with equality in mind minimizes the risk of anyone being subjected to these atrocities. So no matter how you look at it, equality makes financial sense. For the down payment of doing the proactive work now, you're repaid several times over. Um, continuing on, I want to talk about, oh, I can see that our time is running up. I'm uh, really good at just babbling on, uh, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, Last thing I want to talk about the industry in terms of initiatives branching between individual studios. Oscar mentioned some uh, what I wanted to talk about, so this section won't be that long. So uh, the challenges facing the industry are larger than any single studio. This is something that a single studio can solve on their own. It has to be done by the industry as a mutual uh, project. There are a number of way, different ways this uh, cooperation can be done and has been done. And there are many out there who are working with issues of equality. Um, we just have to find ways to connect them between the companies. Um, projects such as this one, Equal Gaming, um, it makes a difference, but for the work to be sustainable long-term, it has to be integrated into the industry. Um, the game industry needs to be the ones creating positive change, continuing to create positive change. And for that, we need to come together. There are both organizations who work with gathering the industry on all sorts of issues and initiatives, um, and, and also initiatives that work specifically with equality. Um, organizations such as the Swedish Games in Swedish games industry or data skills branch and game habitat where I'm at now are hubs for the industry um, nationally and in the south of Sweden respectively. They provide a platform for the industry to join together on a whole array of topics. Um, there are also like specialized initiatives um, such as well game habitats equality initiative gem and um, Games by Her, Paradox Interactive, a game development course that aims to get more women and non-binary persons into uh, the game industry. 
Um, there are also networks such as Women in Games and uh, funds such as Wings who financially support indie games developed by women and diverse teams. There are many, many other initiatives and many, many people who want to see positive change. The point I'm trying to make is that while you in some ways are competitors, you're also allies in making the industry better. So support each other and each other's initiatives because they benefit all of us. I think I need to round it up. So to summarize, the game industry faces a large number of challenges when it comes to equality, but it's also evident that the will to work toward positive change is really strong within the industry. And there are a lot of really good uh, initiatives and things are slowly improving. Uh, but it's our job to speed up the process. And we can't do this alone. We need to work together create, to create this change. There are many aspects to the situation, um, but it's important to get the somewhat full picture to see how it's all connected, even though listening to uh, me talk about this for an hour can be a bit depressing when you just go through all of the problems that the industry is facing, but we need to get that full picture to be able to move forward. And by working with internal structures uh, within companies, you can improve the games. Uh, by working with quality in the games, you can improve internal structures, all connected and uh, um, swings back and forth. And putting time and money into actively working with the quality and integrating the work into your company have an overwhelmingly positive effect on the games, the work environment, and the money you make. So my recommendation is that you start where you stand. Start by analyzing and reflect, reflecting about yourself and your company. What can you do? Create a good foundation for you to stand on and then extend your reach and just help each other because you're not alone in this. Uh, I also want to take the time to thank you for being here today and for listening to what I've had to say. Um, I, I love working with the game industry, not to be, just because games are a large portion of my life, but also because I truly believe that games have the power to create a better world. Um, it's a creative powerhouse that affects and shapes our society and our culture. It reaches an enormous amount of people and make people laugh and cry and think. And I know that there are many of us who want to see a positive change in the game industry. And I know that for many of us, it's the exact same, exactly the same reasons why we want to see positive change in the world as a whole. Because it's just, because it's fair, and financially speaking, simply the right decision. So I would like to welcome Eliana back to the conversation. Um, what's going to happen next for Equal Gaming is uh, the next event is going to be on the 11th of November. Later during the year, we're going to release a handbook with concrete uh, tools and uh, methods um, on how we can approach working with uh, equality in the game industry. Uh, we will also make sure to send out an, an uh, evaluation to all of you who uh, have listened today, and we would love your feedback. Um, you can also see our uh, contact information if you want to contact us about anything. But I think it's time we open up for questions, if there are any. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jacob. I mean, thank you so much for the very uh, in-depth presentation. And also thank you, Oscar, who is not watching us now, but I'm sure that he's going to catch up later. Um, I think uh, I'm actually, I was just, as Oscar said, I mean, it's just so positive that people are at least start to be interested because we got 
211 registrations for this webinar. So for sure, uh, the, there are people who are really already starting uh, this change and they're very interested to know more what to do. Um, as Jacob said, we're going to start uh, the Q&A session. I guess to warm up, I do have a question. Um, I think you and, of course, you and Oscar talked a little bit about the very small first steps. Of course, you talked about long term and change that are needed, but as well, we mentioned about things that are happening and organization. Thank you so much for the shout out for GEM, uh, Game Hub Tech Initiative, and the other organizations that people could uh, get involved and contact for more information. But I also was thinking, uh, you just mentioned before uh, about some challenges that still exist in the community and then maybe perhaps some kind of a resistance. And then um, I was wondering, why do you think that is like this maybe re resistant to change? And then um, uh, why do you think that there are parts that are actually difficult right now in the game community? Um, th th now we're going out into a bit of more speculative part because to properly determine this, it would need quite a lot of research. But I do think that one thing that comes into play is the fact that there are a lot of people within the game community and in the game industry that at some point in their life, in some way or another, felt like outsiders. Uh, I know that's true for me. I know it's true for uh, many of my friends who are in the game community. Uh, and when you finally find somewhere a community, a place where you feel like you belong and you are part of the normal of the norm, it, you become very protective of it. And if you face something that can challenge the way things are in that community, it also means that you are facing the possibility of feeling like an outsider again. And you become really protective, um, which is, it's natural to re react in that way. It's kind of like a self-defense. Um, but I need, I think we need to remember that letting more people into our community and into our industry uh, doesn't mean that you are gonna be left outside. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Mia uh, here in our chat. Uh, she's uh, saying thank you guys. And um, I'm graduating and curious about where I can get more info on studios and companies. They are trying to hire a more diverse workforce. Um, right now, I don't know of any uh, anyone who's kind of gathered the info and I don't know, rated it but um i am kind of guessing here that you're a student from the game assembly so you're based in malma or at least Guana. what i would recommend is um talking to uh two studios and be aware when you're applying like be observant of how are they communicating uh what kind of games do they make and when you get uh, brought in for an actual interview ask them outright um in what way they are working with equality. Because that also sends signals from you as a future employee and part of the workforce that this is something that is important for you. Yeah, if we talk about this, uh, I can also answer, if we talk about this region, um, you know, the major game studios uh, in the region of South Sweden, they are members and they are part of Game Habitat, therefore they actually stand for our mission and our vision to create uh, a diverse and equal uh, industry here as making the best environment for game developers, which of course is uh, completely based and being a sustainable, diverse and equal um, uh, industry. Uh, so for instance, as Jacob mentioned before about the GEM initiative from Game Habitat, we have a advising board that is compiled by uh, the major studios in, in Malmo. Uh, and with there, I can totally say that the studios like uh, IO, uh, Interactive, Avalanche, and uh, Paradox, and Shark Mob, and Massive, you know, King, they all, they all have some um, 
um, initiatives and programs that work in it. Like if they are not there yet, they are developing and they're trying to find ways to do that. And they surely they are trying to hire uh, a more diverse uh, people. So if you're just looking for job opportunities, uh, you can check Game Habitat Facebook group. Uh, we normally, we and the students normally post jobs there. Uh, also going to share in the end a QR code so you can join our Discord uh, community where we have a channel just for jobs uh, where as our well, studios post their jobs there and there are some Facebook groups as well that you can look for jobs in Sweden uh, normally in this region but in the whole Sweden like game industry jobs um, so I, I can just try to um, link here in the chat for you, you might be helpful. Yes, and she said she would love the Discord. Yes, uh, so if you're not part of Game Hub Discord, yes, I'm gonna the next slide they're gonna show you can join and then you can find more about the jobs they are available in the region and as well our next events. Uh, as Jacob said, we have a very exciting uh, series of activities. This is just the kicking, uh, we're just kicking off eco gaming um, activities with this webinar, but we're gonna have some workshops and some other events coming up all the, uh, this year and as well next year. So we're gonna make sure to share uh, more information in the Discord as well. So uh, please join. Uh, we have more people saying thank you. Um, there's Frederica, let me go back here in the chat. Sorry, there's another question. Uh, do you roughly know how the gender equality in the gaming industry differs in other countries, say Denmark or Germany compared to Sweden? No, uh, to be honest, uh, not specific countries, um, but compared to what it is in uh, all of Europe, um, it's it's slightly better in Sweden. Um, Sweden is one of the countries that are leading the way in terms of equality in the game industry, um, which is something we should be proud of, and uh, also like the Malmö studios that I have had the chance of meeting and talking to throughout uh, this year are uh, like super inspiring. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have numbers for what it's like in uh, Denmark or Germany. Um, I can try to find it. And then as we are sending out the evaluation, if I find it, I can include it there, um, if that would help. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. I mean, uh, we have the email of everyone who registered for our events, uh, so we can definitely follow up with some information. We can share perhaps the slides from Jacob, so you can have that in PDF. And then again, uh, if it, in case this QR code is not working on your screen, they're sharing now uh, here on Zoom, uh, I can also send the inv invitation link to our Discord via email. And then we can make sure to follow up some more information. Also, Oscar mentioned about the report that he wrote uh, uh, earlier this year, and we have the report in PDF, and we'll make sure to send the full report to everyone as well, so you can uh, read more in details uh, about what he talked about. Henrik Svensson has a question as well, a bit of a spe speculative question, but here it is. Where would you say we'll be in five years from now? And what is the ideal situation for that time? <laughs> Ooh, a tough question. Um, <laughs> I think that within the next five years, we will really say, see the game that manages to, um, uh, to catch the demographic that is falling off uh, the curve at around 13, like uh, young girls. I think we will f see the game that manages to like keep everyone, regardless of gender, uh, in that step from like a kid to a teenager, um, which will lay the groundwork for when they are studying game design and uh, when they join the workforce. Um, so I think that within the next five years, we will see uh, like the foundation built for long-term solutions within the game industry. And then short-term, I, th well, uh, we will see um, the gender distribution uh, balancing out further uh, within the next five years. Uh, 
if it continues the way it has right now, it will be at 26% women. Uh, but I think we can hope for a little bit more than that. So let's say 30, 35% realistically within the next five years. Um, and then generally, I think we will see that equality will be brought higher on the agenda, that more studios will have equality integrated in their workflow. So it doesn't become like the separate project, you know, um, but rather it's a part of the everyday, everyday work. Um, so that's where I think we'll be realistically within the five years. But the ideal situation is always like, uh, it will just be perfect, you know? <laughs> Exactly, and and I think it's uh, it's uh, we moving in a positive way, as uh, you said. Like we are growing, uh, the the numbers are changing quite rapidly, actually. And uh, also, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I do know that, for instance, at the game assemblies, the game education here in Malmo, uh, they managed to raise a lot the number of uh, female applicants uh, this year, which is great. Which I know. Uh, I hope most of them are here with us today as well, listening to this. So shout out to the Game Assembly. So also, I just gonna, that's the QR code here. And I just wanna say, uh, before we finish, that you can get in touch. Uh, I have to just go back with the slides. You can get in touch with us. Um, so uh, Jacob had shared already uh, his email information. So if you want to get in touch with uh, the project Eco Gaming and get in touch with Jacob, that's the email there. Also, as we mentioned, Eco Gaming is run by the organization Jan Stahl with Beckling Skona. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> Equality Development in Skona. Uh, they are, of course, work with equality in, in this region that we are now, the region of Skona, and not only in games, but in general. So if you also want to reach out to them, there's the website there. You can get to know more about the other projects uh, uh, where EcoGame is focused in game development. They also have other projects focusing on the industry. So if it's interesting, just uh, reach out to them. And for Game Habitat, uh, we are always looking for help. Uh, we are always looking for uh, speakers and uh, let's just go back, volunteers and mentors to help, like to do events like this. So you can, uh, if you want to share your knowledge and you're just in the platform, please reach out to us. And if you want to get involved and help us with projects such as Eco Gaming or Gem or in, you know some other projects that we run through uh, Game Habitat, please get in touch with me as well. Here is our beautiful team at Game Habitat. It's Peter, who is also here with us as our CEO, and Henning also with us is the special ops at our co working space in Malmo, DevHub. And then that's me. Uh, and then it's our email. So if you want to talk to us, just reach out to hello at gamehabitat.se. Once again, thank you so much, Jacob, for the presentation. I'm really looking forward to the next Eco Gaming events. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining, and I hope you have a lovely uh, rest of the day. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.